Hi, everyone. I'm James Garbutt. And I'm Denny Dumas. And this is the Garbutt Dumas Real Estate Podcast. Uh, this episode, we're going to talk about things that we run into. Uh, I mean, we sell all ages, new, old, 80s, 90s, 100-year-old homes, condos and houses. Uh, and, and we'd want to talk about some of the common things we run into some of the common deal breakers that we run into in inspections, um, and also just kind of what's what's a big deal and maybe what's not such a big deal. After you heard that, Tyler, you're probably thinking, this, wow, this is going to be a boring one. But <clears throat> I will let you know that we are very high energy this morning, so even though the topic sounds boring, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're coming off a big night last night, Jamie. Had a really, really uh, very positive, exciting experience with a seller. How many offers? And I'm pumped. Nine offers. Nine offers. House with a suite. This, I, yeah, exactly. Renovated upstairs, great layout with a suite on a busy street. What year is it built? Uh, or roughly? Early 50s. Oh, 50s. <clears throat> that, that, that jives with our topic. It sure does. <laughs> it sure does. 50s, an yeah. era of asbestos, an era of uh, aluminum wiring, mm-hmm. an era of clay drain tile. Uh, Maybe. Potentially. Potentially, yeah. <clears throat> the winning bid did not do an inspection. So, so we uh, never will know. <laughs> we will never know. Well, I mean, this is a house in New West that Denny's talking about in New West. Uh, you know, there, there's homes built in the eight, late 1800s. I mean, you I own one. one of them. Yeah, yeah, I have one of them, 1891. Yeah. Uh, in between, call it 1880-ish to 2021, there's a lot of difference in materials. And uh, you know what? Let's start with just straight up. You know, house inspections happen for these old homes. What are some of the common things that we might run into? And I'm, I'm going to just throw up like electrical to start. And even as realtors to be aware of, based on the age of the home that you're walking into, to look for as you're going through showings too. Not just wait for the home inspection to happen. Yeah, you know, when I go into an older home, one of the things that I often find myself doing is just looking at the electrical panel. Totally. So it's it's... It's always on the list, and particularly when it's an older home. If it's a brand new home, I assume it would be like a 200 amp, but it's always nice to confirm. Um, but uh, yeah, very old homes back in the day, early 1900s, may have had knob and tube wiring with a 60 amp service. And to today's standards, in the world of, you know, where basement suites matter, where people are plugging in their cars and washer and dryers, I think when these homes were built, I don't know if they had dryers back then, uh, but... The, a 60 amp service is just insufficient for most homes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, on the low end, the building code is 100 amp service. Um, but yeah, that, looking, at the, looking at the electrical panel, I guess just two cautions here. Usually on the electrical panel, you'll find one big breaker that will show either 100, 125, or 200. And that's kind of the amperage that goes in. Maybe on the sticker, it even specifies how many amps. But one thing I will caution is it's rare but I have run into cases where the panel doesn't match the service coming in. So uh, this is a rare free, you know, rare occurrence, but uh, this was a 200 amp panel that didn't have a 200 amp service coming in. So I guess just a few cautions. Don't pretend to be an expert of this magic thing called electricity that we don't understand unless we're, uh, you know, electricians. Um, but the panel will often specify what the amperage is. Uh, 200 amps is great if you have a house with a suite or you want a hot tub or you want to have plug-in electric cars. Uh, that usually is sufficient. Um, recognize the amperage is usually stated on the panel. The panel may not match the service state on the amperage. And even if it looks like a newer panel, when you remove the cover, there could be some old wiring going to it. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean that the full electrical system is updated. And if you run into a home that has, say, an, uh, an old panel, um, a pretty common number I've been quoted to upgrade to a 200 amp panel from say a 60 or 100 is around 3,500 to 4,000. Carl, you're in the business. Is, am I way off on that? No, that's about okay, 3,500 to 4,000. And that's just the panel. Panel, correct? yeah. I mean, there might be some other stuff going around that, but yeah. yeah, typically just a panel upgrade, not a full wiring. Okay. You know, I've I've done a couple homes where there was a full wiring needed. And I think, uh, let's say a 3,000 square foot home that's say 70 years old where you're doing the panel and every wire in the house for the most part, that's that's probably gonna be twenty five dollars to $30,000. And uh, that's, you know, it can go up from there if you get crazy with automation. Uh, I mean, you can have new homes that have $100,000 electrical bills or more. Uh, but just on the low end, I would say, if you have a 2,500 square foot 
home that needs a full rewiring and updated service, I'd say it's probably 20 grand on the low end. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> electrical, a little history here, Denny. Mm -hmm. I did some research prior to coming here. So prior to World War II, it was common to have, uh, in houses that were built, it was common to have one outlet per house. And now the code is every 12 feet, you need an outlet and six feet within a door. And there's other, some parameters, but basically the intent is to avoid extension cords. Say that one more time. So one, one outlet. outlet per room. Oh, you said, said per did house. I say, did I say per house? <laughs> you said okay. per house. Scratch that. I'm just envisioning Prior in my head. Prior to like... World War II, one outlet per room was common. And now it's every 12 feet. So my apologies. I just envision that. like a lineup in front of this outlet. People trying to charge <laughs> their phone and their iPad and like watch TV. And yeah, yeah. In the in the home that I have, that's quite old. It's one outlet per room and no closets. So they yeah, definitely didn't go. have yeah. the luxuries we have today. Um, you know, ground fault circuit mm -hmm. interrupter GFCI uh, outlets weren't uh, a thing back in the day, and those are common around any water source. You know, bathrooms, kitchen, uh, garages, decks. Uh, aluminum wiring was very common in the 60s and 70s. I think it was even around in the 50s. And that was just, that was troublesome because it would overheat and it would cause fires on occasion. Uh, and then knob and tube wiring was <clears throat> quite common from the 1880s to the 1940s, often with a 60 amp service, often comes with issues with home insurance. Mm -hmm. You have to disclose that to your insurance provider. And I imagine aluminum as well, and it could affect your insurance premium. It, it could affect your ability to get insurance. And even if you say buy a home that has knob and tube and the insurer doesn't like it, you, you know, sometimes they'll give you some sort of temporary status, but you, once you move into the home, you, you uh, upgrade it. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there have been challenges in the past with getting insurance on knob and tube. It home. seems like that's a moving target because uh, like I remember a couple of years ago, it was very challenging and a lot of insurance companies just said no versus in the last couple of years, it seems like they've been more lenient for some reason. I don't know why, but we have a few sellers with homes that have knob and tube in them and they have zero problem getting insurance. Yeah. So it seems like it changes. The I standards change all the time in, in terms of insurance companies. I think we should also acknowledge that a lot of, you know, some of these people are providing accurate in, information sure. to their insurance companies. And some of these people are just have no clue and their insurance policy may not reflect what they actually yeah. have in their home. And, uh, they just do, they just say what they need to get insurance, I yeah. guess. Um, That's probably a caution there, yeah. uh, ladies and gentlemen that are listening. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> when you see something on an insurance uh, registry, I don't know what, application, that's the word I was looking for, and you don't know what it is, like knob and tube, don't just say, huh, never heard of that. No. <laughs> I, either you should probably do a little bit of digging and find out. Or yeah. <laughs> and, and you should also recognize that a lot of people have insurance policies that, that aren't accurately filled out. Yeah. You know, um, you know, we often have clients or buyers send us, hey, here's what our insurance provider needs to know. And then we'll try to get the answers to the best of our knowledge or bounce it off the listing agent or the seller. Mm -hmm. But the odds of them knowing the information accurate is is hit and miss. Yeah. And, and you had, need to fill in something to get that insurance. So I guess the suggestion there is if you don't want to run into any issues after you move into the home and take possession, maybe have the insurance agent or an inspector or someone that knows all the items on that insurance list and can give you a more accurate idea of what you have. Mm -hmm. All right, Danny, let's, uh, let's move from electrical to plumbing. Okay. Like it. You know, we, <clears throat> we hear this, what, what's the most common thing that you run into when it comes to plumbing? What, Challenges? Or I guess the inspection deal breakers. Hmm. Are you talking about the 80s and 90s? I am. <laughs> <laughs> Polly B. And I know yeah. I remember you uh, having a chat with an insurance provider yeah. recently. So I'd love you to share that story just on. So not just the insurance provider, Denny, also Wikipedia. Oh. So both, both have validated <laughs> that. Yeah, Polly B is a big thing, a big topic. And I, you know, it's one of the things that I tend to look for when I show a home in the 80s or 90s. I just look under the sink or look for, you know, where it were in that mechanical room. Uh, I look for evidence of gray pipes and it's like a gray plastic looking pipe. And, and that gray is polybutylene, poly B. And it has a bad reputation. And I've seen, I've seen people that buy homes in this area that are fully poly B pipes. Like it might be in floor hot water heating. It's often used for hot water systems. Um, and they will rip or disconnect or rip it all out and change it to electric baseboard. And it's because oftentimes there's there's home inspectors that communicate that it's gonna fail. And 
if you buy a home that has in-floor heating that is running through poly B pipes and, you know, I've seen a number of homes in the last few months that were beautiful 4,000, 6,000, 5,000 square foot homes yeah. that have this gray pipe heating the home in the floor. And it's hard to say that like they, the reason why it comes up in conversation is because they do have a history of failing. The, I think that legend or the, the reputation of its failure rates has been blown out of control. Mm -hmm. um, I, I imagine from my understanding, if the polybutylene pipes in the home also have poly B, um, uh, the plastic they? fittings, fittings. Yeah. <clears throat> so all the joints and fittings are poly B, they're more likely to fail. Yeah. But if it's poly B pipes with copper fittings, it's, it's a much lower risk. Yeah. And so both the insurance provider I spoke with, um, and Wikipedia, if you Google it, will say that it's very low occurrence. So I, I guess it's something that is is not always as scary as it may appear. Mm -hmm. the The problem that I that I have a trouble with, and and you know maybe someone has a clear answer, but I don't think there is one. But when you buy a home that is four thousand square foot home, because a lot of the homes built in the eighties and nineties have good envelopes, good structures, and you and it's dated, so you have old tile, old carpet, old floors. Do you rip out all the poly B at that time when you redo the floors or do you let it have a chance to live its life and see when it fails? And that's that's where I struggle is because the cost of replacing a poly B system on a larger home can be very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be like easily north of $30,000 if it's in-floor heat, um, upwards of 40 or 50 potentially. And when you put new flooring down and you over top of that product that has a sketchy reputation, that may leak 20 years down the road. Um, that, I think that term may leak, whenever you say it might leak, that, that you know, you, you're more inclined to just rip it out. But yeah, that, that, honestly, that's, that's what I run into and I don't know what the right answer is. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. I haven't, I've never heard of a client who had a problem with it and we've sold many homes that have poly B and I don't know what year it was, probably mid 90s that there was some lawsuits against the manufacturer for some failure of the product. And from what I know from people who are smarter than me in this field that have explained mm -hmm. it to me is that the problem was with the fitting. So that's something I'll always look for whenever I go into an 80s and 90s homes is, is locate poly B. It's fairly easy to locate. It's gray and it's coming off the hot water tank or it's like Jamie said, underneath the sinks or if, it, if there's a crawl space or an unfinished basement, you can see it running through the joists. <clears throat> and you look for the fittings, look for our, where there's joints in the piping, where it's turning, is it gray or is it copper? Mm. And from what I've been told, if those joints are copper, you're pretty much safe mm. versus if they are, um, if they're poly B, if they're gray, that's what was known to have issues in the past. But when you are looking at that home and you see zero history of leaks and it's been there for 35 years, the likelihood of it leaking tomorrow is pretty low. That's, I, I guess, you know, if if you're buying a home that's built in that era mm -hmm. and you feel that like in East Vancouver, for example, those like East Van specials, yeah. I think I'd have a tough time ripping it all out. And I've had a client do that, like an East Van special where they just voluntarily ripped out all the poly B and mm -hmm. changed it to electric baseboard. Um, mm -hmm. So the poly B never failed. And since they did that 10 years ago, their electrical bills have been much higher because yeah. it's an inefficient, yeah. it's an expensive way to heat your home. Um, but maybe if I ran into, say, a poly B on Westwood Plateau, where you have these large homes that probably won't, won't be torn down in the foreseeable future, maybe that might, you know, if you're looking at a 10, 20 year horizon, maybe that may justify just the peace of mind of knowing you have, uh, like if you want your 1990s home to be, like have today's systems and standards and be perceived as a new home, maybe I would voluntarily upgrade the poly B system in those cases. So I think it would come down to how much house value you have versus land value. Totally. And if you have a lot of land value, ride it out. If you, if you have a lot of house value and it's a luxury area, a high-end area, I think I'd probably steer towards giving the future buyer peace of mind. And that may cost just a lot of money. Totally. And may never fail as well. <laughs> That's the struggle. So I think... Overall, 1980s and 90s, you're looking, if you're looking at homes or apartments or condos in that era, pipes <clears throat> is where we go. We look under the sink. And then separately from that, that happens to be an era with another issue. 
another issue, the leaky condo, mm. condo era, the, the poor design. <laughs> the, I, I, I did a quick little research prior to this. And what I found is the leaky condo era in BC caused $4 billion in damages, affected 900, billion, or 900 buildings and 31,000 people. That's 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 the scope. That's why it was such a big deal. Hmm. And in New West, where we're doing this podcast, the New Westminster Key was one of the one of the centers that was was known for this. They had a lot of buildings down there that were affected. Uh, I know there's still prominent developments around Vancouver, like oh, she's the one on Broadway and East Van. That gets a lot of uh, publicity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that that yes, that that still are leaking today, and. The whole issue was that in the 80s and 90s, um, they had this postmodernism style, which is like, which was like that Mediterranean or very common in South California. And it's kind of like a, a stuck, think of a stucco siding structure with no overhang. It's basically, you have a poor material for this climate and no water keeping, no overhang to keep the water away from the walls. So if you run into a, you know, like a, any sort of, house or condo that just has an exposed wall of stucco with no overhang, it's a candidate to be leaky. And if you see hairline cracks below windows and those hairline cracks likely have moisture behind them. Um, now, there's a lot of things that do look like stucco and a real easy thing, uh, you know, that, that same wall might have a stucco face on it, but if it's broken up by metal flashing at every level, that means it's been upgraded to rain screen likely. And if there's flashing above and below each window, that's a good sign that it's been rain screen. So I guess, you you know, you can have stucco walls without overhang, uh, but it's not recommended. Mm -hmm. I don't see many new buildings being designed that way today. And if they don't have an overhang today, they definitely don't put stucco on the walls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I honestly can't even remember the last time I saw a new strata building that was stucco. Like early two thousands, maybe. No, maybe. I mean, maybe it would go with like a a Tudor style. <laughs> I don't know. I can't That's, remember one. Yeah, though. <clears throat> there's just better material. It's interesting to like look back. We're looking back a hundred years right now, and pointing out all the deficiencies in building and construction uh, material. Right at the time, those were completely acceptable materials, mm -hmm. and it's really just us looking back and critiquing like problems that have happened and building code has changed because of these problems, et cetera. But <clears throat> there's something I want to ask you. And in 20 years from now, we can come back. There's a few things that we didn't talk about, but in 20 years from now, what do we look back on in today's building code and say, oh, that was a mistake, like <laughs> the stucco against plywood? I, I, I don't like from a, from a construction, like a like a construction assembly point of view, the way that they put a wall together, yeah. the way that they're going to put a wall in the step code five environment that's slowly coming coming out. I think that's pretty solid. Like, I, I don't think I can critique that. Yeah. I would assume that the PEX plumbing uh, of today, the PVC, the copper, has passed the test of time. Mm -hmm. I'd assume that today's electrical has passed the test of time. Mm -hmm. So what I really think, uh, and, and, and drainage with waterproofing and, and the dimple wrap that goes around the foundation, um, better waterproofing down there as well. So I, I think that they've worked out the kinks. I think really what the issue is 20 years from now is the install errors that happen with a lot of the stuff. You know, yeah. you can have, a, you know, just on the foundation, you can have that waterproofing sprayed on and that dimple wrap going all around really well. But if the person that puts it on leaves a few little gaps in that assembly, well, those are the weak points. Yeah. And then I think a real common thing that drives me nuts is just the inconsistencies and poor decisions of some of these modern house designs that you see popping up. Like a modern design is a very flexible design. You know, flat roof, square shapes, maybe angles. But not everyone's doing overhangs on these designs. And some people like to have natural wood facing south with no overhang. And, you know, you can have a box or modern style home that that some of them really connect on them. They look phenomenal. And some try and miss the mark completely. And, and I mean, just on the highest level, if you have natural wood facing south with no overhang, you're going to regret that in 5, 10, 20 years. So don't put natural wood facing south. Or just natural wood without overhang is, is going to be a challenge. Yeah. But natural wood facing south without overhang uh, is gonna just going to fail. So I, I, I've seen that on some moderns. Um, I just think overall, in general, anytime you have a wall that's highly exposed, that w rain can hit it directly, 
Uh, and I, and, and I'm, I mean, what comes to mind is these, a, a lot of modern homes I see in Burnaby. Um, yeah, I, I think that those, any material that's exposed direct to rain, that's not say metal or fiber cement, um, or, or maybe it's wood with metal flashing on it, but it's not protected by some sort of flashing or mm -hmm. a material that that's more durable. Yeah. I, I think it's going to fail. I think there's a lot of modern homes that are poorly designed that are just going to design in a way that ex is exposed to the weather. So I don't know. Is there anything else that comes to mind, Denny? I think other than that, my my complaints more towards zoning. <laughs> uh, no, that yeah, I won't go on a, I won't go down that route. But I think it's just really design, and Fair the enough. design part is really a, a big issue with the leaky condos. It's not just about the stucco. It's it's really just you can have eighties and nineties. I've seen eighties. Well, nineties is really an era where um, it was right before the rain screen, but they started. You know, there's there's certain developments that come to mind in the 90s that were kind of that West Coast Whistler style overhangs, peaked roof design. And they may not be rain screen, but because they had the overhangs, the water stayed away from the walls and they're doing just fine. So, you know, number one is keeping the water away from the walls. And if and and if you're also rain screen, and rain screen is basically the this the the, the main, I guess, importance of a rain screen wall is that it has uh, a cavity between the siding and the actual structure of the wall. That's an air gap that allows, if water gets behind the siding, which it can happen, it allows that there's an air gap there that allows the water to just run out and it won't just be stuck there and cause mold or mildew and rot. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the real importance of rain screen. Where was I going with that, Denny? Um, one thing we didn't talk about from early days, pre 19 70 let's say is oil tanks oh yeah that's a good one oil tanks is a real big one that's part especially of the especially in new ass vancouver yeah, yeah, yeah totally so 1970s oil tanks aren't very common but they do exist in the 70s so if you have a if you're buying if you're representing a buyer and a realtor uh on a 1970s home usually we put that oil tank clause in it um in the contract 1960s and before could be there the, the challenge with oil tanks is, well, one, uh, it's not always easy to find out if they exist. And uh, I mean, we've done episodes on oil tanks in the past. I, I mean, just in short, uh, a geo, a, a ground penetrating radar scan, a GPR scan um, is, is like a sonar scan that looks through the ground is the most accurate way to scan a home for a tank. So if you, if you are buying a home 1970s or before, it's important to get an oil tank scan. It can be with a metal detector. It can be with a GPR. But oftentimes there's going to be some sort of obstacles that you can't scan under. And so if you are if you have like a concrete pad around the home that has rebar in it, a metal detector may go off. A GPR scan might see through it and be more accurate. If you have a deck that's two, three feet off the ground, that's a wood deck, neither of them may be able to scan underneath of it without the deck being removed. So if the oil tank exists underneath the wood deck that's a little bit off the ground, but you can't scan under, yeah, you're, you're going to have an inc inconclusive scan. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I've had clients buy homes in that era and, and we've got the best scan possible for 60% of the perimeter of the home, but the other 40% was just not scannable. And then the conversation is, well, we can put a clause in here that says if an oil tank is discovered, you can go back to the seller. But realistically, it's going to involve you taking apart the deck. And if you want that option, um, basically, the way that I would do it is maybe unless the seller is willing to have ongoing liability for the rest of their life, I would say give it maybe a year after completion where you can go back to the seller and, and you put it on the buyer of the home to say, hey, you have one year to decide if you're going to take apart this deck and scan underneath to see mm -hmm. if you find a tank. Most people don't do it. But um, oil tanks are one of those things where 20 years ago, I don't think it was as big of a deal as it is today. And even if you do buy a home where there's evidence of an oil tank being pulled out 20 years ago, um, you know, I've, I've had, we've had clients that say, yeah, an oil tank existed. It was pulled out in 2000. Well, if it was, if they have record of the tank being pulled out, but no record of soils being tested and remediation being done, then that can, al that can almost be worse from a lender point of view. Because we've had lenders say, well, you have a tank, you've proven that a tank existed, yeah. but you haven't proven, uh, but that means that soil contamination could exist and it, it hasn't been removed to today's standards. So if you have a tank that's evidence is, that has been removed, but there's no soil uh, evidence there, 
then lenders could have issues with it. We have had deals that have required soil testing in order to get the mortgage. Mm -hmm. Rare though, rare though. What does soil testing cost? Oh, geez. Well, I think um, on the low end, on the lucky end, I think it's twenty five hundred. But it, I think realistically, it's probably three to four thousand on a typical five to six thousand square foot lot in the city. And I could be off on that, but I do know a client that that paid fifteen hundred for it five years ago. So I'm, I'm I think that they got a smoking deal at fifteen hundred <laughs> at the time. I think the other quote was twenty five hundred. So I'm coming. I'm guessing twenty five to five grand, Denny, <laughs> and more so if on bigger properties or commercial. I'm sure, like I mean, soil testing is very common in, in, in like industrial, for example. But but residential, it's it's not. It's not common at all. Totally. But I, I think just recognize that whatever the future today lenders like to see if a tank's removed and if a tank is removed the documents that come with the remediation if you have just one and not the other it may cause issues if you have none no evidence of a tank or or can't find it the lenders don't even think about it um but re recognizing the future it they, the criteria could change around oil tanks and it could be more of a thing and yeah today's standards may change totally <clears throat> Next topic we haven't talked about asbestos. Oh yeah. Okay. So good thing you 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 you're thinking about buying your 1980s home <laughs> that has poly B and and uh, uh, California stucco. Yeah. <laughs> good news is it probably doesn't have asbestos. Yeah. <laughs> so asbestos was kind of up into the 80s, and 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 you know it's it's very common. I mean I've 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 done hazardous material testing on homes before, where they take three samples of each of each asbestos potentially containing material on each level. So they kind of just butcher up a house and take a little punch holes everywhere. And, and it can be, it can be in older homes built in the early 1900s or mid 1900s. It can be in all sorts of places, you know, uh, insulation around a hot water tank, insulation around hot water pipes. Um, it can be in the plaster of the walls and the ceilings, and it can be an asbestos tile on the floor, asbestos shingle on the outside of the home. Um, insulation. Insulation, vermiculite. Uh, yeah, those are, I mean, those are kind of the common things. And and I guess from my understanding of it, you, you know, uh, some people don't want asbestos in their home at all. Realistically, if you don't own an older home, it's somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. um, there's higher risk asbestos and lower risk asbestos from a health perspective. If you have vermiculite insulation, don't go up in your attic and stir it around. Uh, if you have asbestos in the plaster behind your lath and plaster wall with cove ceilings in your 1940s home, and it's covered by 10 layers of paint since then, it's probably not in the air and probably not going to affect your respiratory system. Um, but those are, you know, you can always get air quality tests to ensure that. Uh, but yeah, I, I think asbestos is so common. Most of us are living with it if we're living in an older home. Um, and when you do a renovation to a home, uh, you have to get those materials tested before they get ripped out. Mm -hmm. And I guess removal of asbestos can be very expensive. You know, even one garbage bag. Well, what's a garbage bag removal? Because I, I, I had a contract to remove a garbage bag and I think it was a garbage bag. It was like $300 or something yeah. like that. Yeah, just to, just to show up and take a garbage bag worth of material. And then, uh, but like, you know, it's common to have ten, twenty thousand $20,000 asbestos removal bills. Yeah. Easy, easy. <laughs> So asbestos uh, is more of a thing when you are demoing a home because you have to, or, or doing a renovation because you have to get rid of it. Um, when you're living in the house, you, it's more of a concern um, if you're going to do any of the renovation work and you want to know what you're working with, or an attic, you know, vermiculite. If you're going to be storing stuff up there and going up there periodically, that might be one that I would replace. So asbestos, up until the 80s, Danny. Okay. <clears throat> Should we go into strata a little bit and just kind of give a quick summary? I know we've done other podcasts yeah. on like <clears throat> due diligence when you're buying into an older strata, but maybe just mention a bunch of the things that could come up based on year. Yeah, I think Cole's notes of this, I, you know, let's go backwards. So 2000 to today, uh, 2000 was around when rain screen was uh, adopted. Mm -hmm. So when you're buying a place that's, built in 2000 to today, I think the most common thing that you're going to run into is just developer design errors. You know, the developer may have made a mistake somewhere with something like maybe they, you know, the lowest bidder gets the job with these sites. And, and I, I think when we're looking at depreciation reports for places built after 2000, the most common thing that I seem to run into is just, you know, 
maybe in the early 2000s, there might have been some decks that weren't in like deck railings that were installed on the top of the membrane instead of the sides yeah. so that, that, that the decks could be failing soon. So mm -hmm. decks might be something to look at for early 2000s. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes in those reports, it's just, oh, this flashing needs to be fixed. Oh, this, yeah. it, it, you know, it's just a laundry list of design or install errors. I mean, do, do you see anything like from post 2000? No, the decks was going to be the one of the bigger things, like maybe improper sloping of the deck so that water is pooling, so that yeah. they deteriorate faster, things like that. Yeah. But, uh, roofs as well, it's for whatever reason, seems like a lot of the flat roofs aren't sloped properly and water just pools there and that deteriorates and puts a lot of pressure on the on the structure on the roof. Lois, Lois Bitter gets the job. <laughs> well, that's where developer reputation comes into play. You know, totally. uh, like developers like Boza, I think even though Boza did have leaky condos back in the day, I think they've done a lot since then to restore the reputation. And when you hear it's Boza built, you, you kind of just have extra peace of mind. Um, and I think they've earned that reputation. And there's others like that too. Uh, but yeah, condos, so 2000 or earlier, you're looking, you know, there's, I don't think systematically you're, you're looking at significantly different technology than today. Yeah. So it's more uh, those things that we just mentioned. 80s, 90s, really common to have design flaws, you know. Um, but if it's, but in the 80s, 90s, I think it's more, you know, you're more likely to just run into a lot of things coming to the end of the lifespan. You know, yeah. you might have a building that hasn't done much that might need a roof coming up, might need a, some exterior paint or some siding upgrades at that point. Elevator. Decks, elevator. Parkade. Parkade, you know, um, parkade's a big one. You know, uh, these, and, and it could be, I, I see it more common in kits in 1970s and 60s where you see, uh, you know, all these parking stalls underneath the underground parking that divert water leaking into the parkade away from their car through channels of aluminum siding or something like that. But, um yeah, I, I think uh, parkade is probably a big ticket item. Uh, that's probably less common in the 80s and 90s, but possible and more common 70s, 60s, and earlier. And what it is is they they didn't have waterproofing and dimple wrap and all these things to keep water away from the concrete. So over time, water seeps through the concrete. That efflorescence, white, st chalky stuff that you see on the inside of the walls builds up. And, and over time, that can rust the rebar behind the walls. Those cracks and, and gaps can increase, and it can just cause more and more leakage coming in. And I guess maybe it, it gets to the point where it's a structural issue. So it, on some of these older buildings, a parkade could mean not just the walls, but the landscaping planters for the ground-level units above it. And when you look at if that is leaking all around and it's at the point where they have to deal with it, that can be a very expensive item. You know, you're digging up all all the dirt around <laughs> that's touching the concrete around the whole parkade, and you're improving the waterproofing of it. Um, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, and well into the millions. And Usually, millions. depending on the yeah. size of the building, and yeah. depending on the size of the parkade, yeah. if it's a twenty unit building with 20 parking stalls it's very different than if it's a you know four buildings in the same strata that are sharing a huge courtyard that it runs over top of the parkade yeah so you know don't use these numbers as like accurate by any means but let's let's talk let's say a, a standard 900 square foot condo built in 1990 if it was leaky and involved a full rain screen that could be a hundred thousand dollars Mm -hmm. If it had a leaky parkade. There's one in New West right now that I think for a 900 square foot one bedroom, they're using a little bit of contingency money, but they're paying 66,000 for a rain screen. That's probably on the low end. You totally. Know? Yeah. And I and, and so I think the range of possibilities is call it 50, which would, you're lucky. <laughs> 66, yeah. you seem lucky too. For a 900 square foot condo uh, on the low end, 50, 60,000 on the high end, 200 probably it would, would be my guess. But I don't think once it gets beyond that, I think, most, unless you have a expensive address, most people aren't dealing with it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I can remember in Tiffany Shores, a one bedroom that was 985 square feet 10 years ago ish, maybe even more, paid 86,000 for an assessment. And that, that's a, that's a low rise development on the new S key. So, um, but, but what my intent here is, is just what these issues translate into dollar figures. Yeah. So a 900 square foot condo rain screen, let's use 100,000 as an approximation. If it has a leaky parkade, my guess would be, let's call it 20,000. 
you know, it, it's probably not going to be a fifty thousand dollar bill. It very well could be if there's not many units and it's big parkade. But um, I, you know, a, a throw throwing up a, a, a number might be twenty thousand. If you had to upgrade the plumbing in the place, that might be ten, maybe twelve. Uh, roof, maybe that's not even a, an assessment, or if it is an assessment, maybe it's twenty five hundred to five thousand. Um, balconies. You know, that usually comes with rain screen, but if it's just balconies, some some older buildings do it as needed. Mm. But if they're doing just doing all the balconies at once, I mean, maybe that's a couple thousand. But elevator, you know, that's elevator and boiler. Sometimes you see the boilers go in these older buildings. A, a boiler might cost, I don't know, thirty to 50000 for a small wood frame old building. And that might translate to 1000 for the unit. Um, an elevator might be... 100,000 for the building, maybe it's 150, that might translate to 2,000 or, or depending on how many units, but I'm throwing up numbers here, Denny. Hopefully yeah. you can kind of stay with me on this. But in a, in a in an 80s, 90s building, your like, rain screen's the big ticket item. Once you get earlier than 80s, 70s or earlier, you're asking about, have the pipes been upgraded? Have, uh, you know, what, what age is the roof? How's the elevator doing? How's the parkade doing? Um, the list goes on. You know, and 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 Kitsilino is a prime example of an area that has that it's important to ask all those questions because every building is different. A lot of them were built, you know, a lot of them are older, and um, yeah, you could be surprised with significant costs going out of out of out of pocket if if you run into multiple issues. Hmm. But in an address like Kits, I think it's worth to upgrade those buildings because it's such an expensive spot. If you had a building in, I don't know. Well, what we used to, well, Poco used to be the example of this, but maybe not anymore. But if you had a building that needed a ton of work in Poco, it may be better to wait for a, a developer to knock on your door than address all the issues. Mm -hmm. um, hard to say. It's case by case. And as owners in those strata, what is your thoughts, recommendations on doing the upgrades, eating the cost? Let's say you need <clears throat> what, whatever it is versus letting your building deteriorate and your resale is going to be very challenging. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to think that once you st start realizing issues that need to be dealt with and it's apparent in the minutes, it's you're relying on a hot market to sell your place well. In a down market, those things become an issue. It's tougher to sell. It devaluates a place. So <clears throat> oftentimes, like rain screen, is a prime example. It's it's an unfortunate expense for someone that wants to be in the building for one more year, yeah. or two more years. But someone that wants to stay in the building for long term, rain screens a must if if it's a good building in a good location. And you know, I I, I don't think you're going to get a one to one return on a rain screen bill, but I think that's a be a, a likely best case scenario. So I think it's possible if you have a sixty six thousand dollar assessment that the moment you your building is rain screened give it maybe a period of a year for the dust to settle and the and everything to kind of uh, balance out. Um, it, I, it's very possible that you might see all that back in resale value. But I think on the low end, I think you're going to see half your bill back. So I, I think rain sc screen adds value to a place. It just may not add 100% of the value that you, that you add to it. The other items like <clears throat> parkade membrane, um, that's one that's expected to be working. Most yeah. buyers would just kind of expect a parkade to be working. So I think that the only thing about, a, the difference about rain screen is rain screen versus non-screen. Rain screen can upgrade the value of building. Parkade membranes are expected to be working. Yeah. <laughs> and if they're not working, that can just only downgrade the value of your building. Or yeah, it, it, in a lot of cases, these are older buildings. In a lot of cases, older buildings are catering to first-time buyers or people that are stretching themselves to get into the market and a $10,000 parkade assessment or $20,000 one may be detrimental. It could be a deal breaker for them. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the market. But, <laughs> yeah. but if you're thinking long-term, do the upgrades. It makes your property more liquid and more sellable in all markets. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking short-term, well, I, that's what Broadway's doing in East End, is it? They've been doing that for a long time. Totally. <laughs> it's it. It, it's tough to give suggestions to people like that, but because it costs a lot of money, I feel like if you keep postponing this, these types of maintenance items and every year they're talking about it in minutes and it just gets voted down, Parkade is an example, you're going to pay for it eventually. Either you pay for it, <laughs> do the upgrades, or you sell your place in five years and you're going to pay for it with a lower sale price. 
I think if, and it also like if you have an, a desirable expensive address, mm-hmm. like a, say a lower Lonsdale and North Van or Kits and um, I mean, a lot of Vancouver period, but uh, it's worth doing these things. It's, it's worth keeping the building up to date when, you know, if you have a building that is up to date and you do renos in the apartment mm-hmm. in a place like Kits, those are value added items mm-hmm. and, and you can get a, a good return on that, especially in a good market like this. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> Yeah, more expensive address, more of a recommendation to upgrade the building. If you're in one of those cases where you have an older building on a lot of land that's unused, uh, that was built a while back, yeah, it, it may be better suited to have a developer knock on your door one day. Or in neighborhoods where you're yeah. seeing newer, larger buildings with higher FSR, yeah, close to SkyTrain, whatever it is. Yeah, Absolutely. And I, I think that just talking about like the financial equation of dealing with these items. I mean, for detached houses, we talked about electrical, plumbing, a lot of the common things. What we didn't mention is, I guess, anything after 2000, the technology they used, it, it should be okay, but you're looking for design errors and install errors that, mm-hmm. that are showing their colors. In the 80s and 90s, you're likely buying a good structure, like a big house with a good functional layout uh, to today's standards. So you're likely working with that house for the foreseeable future. And in those cases, we, we highlighted poly B pipes for, for plumbing. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, that's, and then the design, you know, if, if it didn't have overhangs or California stucco. Prior to the 80s, 1970s is the fringe point. That's where we start to see houses that are more likely to be undersized on larger lots. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, when I'm thinking of a lot of 60s built homes and earlier, I'm thinking, you know, when I look in, say, North Van, New Westminster, Tri-Cities, I I see a lot of 2,000 to, say, 2,600 square foot homes Mm -hmm. that are on 6,000 to 8,000 square foot lots that you can build 4,000 square foot homes on. So if your house is 60% of the buildable area, you know, you, you, you have to start asking yourself, what is it worth? Is it worth upgrading everything? And and I have upgraded an undersized home and I question it sometimes. So sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. It's case by case. There's no rule of thumb. But it is, it, when you're buying a house that is 90% land value or more, um, yeah, it, it may not be worth spending $300,000 upgrading all the systems and, and the kitchens and bathrooms in the home. I agree. <clears throat> Burnaby has a lot of them too. <laughs> North Burnaby, the land value is so high that spending that kind of money on a reno, you're just not going to get it back. No, no, no. So I, I, I think once a house is like, I mean, there, there's no straight line, but 60, if you're 60% of the buildable size and you're a 20, even, I mean, 2,500 square foot home is a good size home. But if it's on a 9,000 square foot lot in Coquitlam and you can build a 5,000 square foot home on that lot, that's well. What's the time horizon here? If you're going to upgrade a 2,500 square foot home, yeah. If the if it's a five year plan, great. If it's a 20 year plan, well, enjoy your upgrades. But at the end of that 20 years, that house is probably going to come down. Yeah. I think we've I like covered it. a lot of it, Danny. I that think was pretty good. Hopefully, you got some value out of this one. <laughs> <laughs>